spider. Um, the the only real problem with the 101 was that there was an aerodynamic problem called a pitch up. Here's, your, here's our F-101. Um, and pitch-up was a, a real problem. They, uh, they were losing quite a few aircraft with this thing called pitch-up. You know, we are far beyond our scheduled uh, termination time. Do you want me to make it short? <laughs> Yeah. 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 I am. Um, every, everybody knew about the pitch-up problem on the, on the 101. Um, they lost quite a few aircraft. Uh, I, you know, I say quite a few. There, there were, back in those days, there were 10 aircraft flying and they had lost two or three. Uh, so that isn't a heck of a lot, but, but a significant percentage of the flying uh, F-101s. Um, the, 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 there were two theories about uh, pitch up. One, one theory was that it was the swept back wing that was causing the pitch up, namely the, uh, the, the, uh, the ends of the wing were stalling and when the ends of the wing were stalling on, on a highly swept back wing aircraft like the 101, uh, the center of pressure would move forward and as the center of pressure moved forward then the uh, then the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the greater amount of the wing would be installed and the, and the pitch up moment on, that, that was what I was looking for, uh, would be increased. And in the space of only, I don't know, like two or three seconds, you would go from normal flight to uh, a pitched up situation. This isn't an F-101, uh, but if you had a, uh, you know, a 20 or 30 degree angle of attack and you pitched up, it would just go vertical. Now, if this was at very low airspeed, uh, you know, you could, and if you had enough altitude, you could probably recover from it. But in aircraft <coughs> flying, uh, broadside to the uh, to the wind at very high speed has a lot more dangerous uh, implications, namely the structural uh, failure. Eventually, we, we found out that it wasn't the swept back wing; that it was the T tail that was causing the problem. Mm -hmm. But in any event, we started flying the F one hundred one with the same caveats that I used before when flying the uh, F-100. I had no aircraft manuals, I had no emergency procedures, I had no uh, routine procedures, I had no airspeed uh, indications about anything. All I had was an aircraft and uh, uh, Pan Whitney's mechanic had gone up to St. Louis and gotten a, uh, a briefing on the aircraft and it was a mechanic who taught me everything I knew about the, the F-101, which was a lot about mechanical systems, but not a heck of a lot about flying aircraft. But we did wind up turns on the F-101 as we had, as I had been doing on the, uh, uh, on the F-100. Now we had three aircraft on the, on the ramp, two F-100s and one F-101. <coughs> Most every day I flew at least one flight. Uh, once a week I would fly two flights on, on a particular day. And occasionally I would fly three flights on, a, on the same day. One each in, the, in our two F-100s 
and one in the F-101. And, and that caused a problem because all three cockpits were different, the instrumentation was different, the feel was different, and the flight test program was different. So uh, you, you don't go to sleep when you're, when you're flying three flights and three different aircraft on the same day. And then there was a very sharp engineer at Fred Whitney, a guy by the name of Stu Hamilton. And the, uh, and, and as you know, a jet engine, uh, the, the nozzle of a jet engine is limited to sonic speeds uh, by virtue of the uh, configuration of the nozzle itself. And it was Stu Hamilton's theory that if you developed what I think he called, but certainly they called, a CD nozzle, convergent divergent nozzle, where the, the angle of the converging portion of the nozzle was specifically chosen and the angle of the divergent section of the nozzle was specifically chosen, that in theory, you could create greater than sonic speeds in the, in the nozzle. And as Ted mentioned before, the thrust of a jet engine is largely determined by the, uh, the exit velocity of the, uh, of the engine. So that if, if he could, or if with his CD nozzle design, we could get in beyond sonic speeds in the nozzle, we would have a much more powerful engine. <coughs> and, this, and this is a picture of our F-101, where we first installed the CD nozzle, first on the right-hand side. It is, I don't know, maybe like two feet longer than the regular uh, jet engine, and you can see the, the divergent portion right there. Uh, it was Stu's theory that, that for optimum performance, that, that uh, divergent section of the nozzle should really be a, a variable um, uh, angle to, to maximize the speed. Uh, we'll, the, the nozzle that we got, or the engine that we got, had a uh, fixed uh, nozzle. It, it, it was either open or, or closed. It, it did not vary with speed or altitude. So whether or not we got maximum uh, thrust from, from that engine, I, I really don't know. And, and whether or not in future aircraft, because that nozzle went into the CD nozzle went into many other aircraft and engines, whether or not they had a variable uh, CD nozzle in, that, in those other aircraft, I, I don't know. But in any event, we put the CD nozzle first on the right-hand side on our F-101, and boy, did it make a difference in, uh, in the speed. The 101 had been at like a Mach 1.5 aircraft, <coughs> and we went up to Mach 1.7 or 7.5 with one engine, and then we put a second uh, CV nozzle in. <coughs> and, and then, pretty easily, we were the fastest aircraft in the world. Um, uh, I offered to uh, fly the aircraft to set a new world speed record with the guys at Fighter Ops, but uh, the Air Force doesn't like civilians setting world speed records. <laughs> so they sent in a Major Adrian Drew, who flew our aircraft and uh, set a new world speed record. And that world speed record was a little bit over 1,200 miles an hour. And we're pretty sure we flew the aircraft faster than he did. Because, <laughs> because among other things, in order to set a world speed record, and they used the, uh, the high altitude tracking range out at Edwards, you were limited by the, uh, the geography of that, that range 
and in particular by the, uh, the, the temperatures uh, on, uh, existing on that range that particular day. And it was our view that uh, if I looked for colder air, I could fly the aircraft even faster than you could fly it right out of Edwards. <coughs> so when I was doing some of the flying, I was heading north uh, out, of, uh, out of Edwards, fly a couple hundred miles and you get a significantly different uh, weather pattern than you, you were getting over, over Edwards. In any event, the, the world speed record was set at uh, a little bit over 1,200 miles an hour, which was about 1.85. After one flight, yeah, or, <coughs> for a minute, after one flight where I had gone quite a bit north, the engineers, uh, a couple days later after reducing the, end, uh, the data, had concluded that we had just hit Mach 2. And indeed, we had quite a bash at one of the engineers' houses uh, that Saturday night, uh, about which I remember very little. <laughs> uh, <coughs> but we called it our our super super double mock party, and I don't remember that name very well either. 